13, and Liberty German, 14, were best friends from the small town of Delphi, Indiana. Abigail and Liberty, affectionately called Abby and Libby by their friends and families, met when they were in the sixth grade. As both girls shared common hobbies and interests, they found that they were in most of the same after-school clubs and sports teams together. Naturally, the girls quickly became friends. Abby and Libby both enjoyed the outdoors and often spent their time outside. They enjoyed outdoor activities, often going fishing, hiking, and biking. They also enjoyed the arts, both sharing a passion for photography. Whenever they were together, you can often find them outside, either playing sports or taking photos of eye-catching natural scenery. Impressively, both girls, at the young ages of 13 and 14, were ambitious, driven, and academically advanced. Both girls were interested in true crime and expressed in an interest in criminology, forensic science and law enforcement. Abby was an aspiring police officer, and Libby was an aspiring science teacher. Libby was currently enrolled in science courses at Purdue University in West Lafayette. In their case, the expression, opposites attract, rang true. Although the girls shared various similar interests, personality-wise, they were very different. Abby was known to be shy and quiet, whereas Libby was known to be more outgoing and forward. Libby was said to be the first to stand up for someone if they were being bullied or treated unfairly. Libby was also the therapist among her friend group, as she was the one her friends would turn to in times of need. February 13, 2017. Libby and her older sister then 16-year-old Kelsey, were in the primary care of their grandparents. Becky and Mike Patty, Abby, an only child, resided with her mother and beloved cat, Bongo. Abby often spent time at Libby's residence, and on the night of February 12th, Abby had spent the night at Libby's. The girls spent their day practicing softball in the yard, watching a movie and creating a watercolor painting. Although the following morning was a Monday, the girls had a day off from school that day. It was one of two unused snow days that the school district, the Delphi Community School Corporation, was required to observe. The girls began their day by eating a special breakfast that Mike had prepared for them. Sometime during noon, Abby and Libby asked Kelsey if she could drop him off at the Mary Gerard Nature Preserve, the local hiking trail. According to Kelsey, the girls had asked her more than once if she would be able to drop him off at the trail about a week prior. Kelsey was either unwilling or unable to take them previously. But as she was going to pass the bridge that day while on her way to her boyfriend's house, she had agreed to drop him off. When Libby had asked Becky for permission to go, Becky compromised that they could go as long as they were able to secure a ride back. Libby had secured a ride back with her father, Derek German. As he was running errands for Becky that day, he told Libby that he would pick them up when he was done. Derek estimated that that would be sometime about 3 p.m. Kelsey dropped off Abby and Libby at 1.45 p.m. at the entrance of the Mary Gerard Nature Preserve. Kelsey stayed in her car and watched the girls proceed inside the trailhead until she couldn't see them anymore. According to Kelsey, she didn't see anyone or anything suspicious. According to the Scene of the Crime Delphi podcast, the trails, which are typically well populated, are as wide and as flat as a small road. The trailhead connects several small parks with numerous access points, information stations, historic memorials, bike rental outlets, and parking spaces. The longest trail, 
the 1.5-mile Monon High Bridge Trail, is one of the more secluded trails in the trail system. Mostly familiar to locals, you can find hikers, bikers, joggers, and photographers traversing this trail. The trail runs between City Park at its western end and the Monon High Bridge on its eastern end. The Monon High Bridge is an old, out-of-use, railroad bridge that was built in 1881. The bridge, at 64 feet, is the second highest bridge in Indiana, as well as the second longest at 845 feet. However, the bridge is not technically part of the trail and visitors are not intended to cross, due to its deteriorated conditions. The bridge is closed off with a metal red barrier to prevent people from crossing the bridge. The bridge, which has no safety barriers, is in a notable state of disrepair. One would have to tread very carefully and watch their footing to cross the bridge safely. Despite the fact that the bridge is closed off to visitors, Local teenagers up to a dare or challenge often crossed the bridge. At 3.11 p.m., Derek sent a text to Libby that read he was on his way and would be there shortly. When Derek arrived at the Mary Gerard entrance at 3.13, Abby and Libby weren't at their arranged meeting point. After waiting two minutes with still no sign of the girls, Derek called Libby's phone. When she did not answer, Derek proceeded to the trails to search for the girls. Derek knew that the lack of response from Libby was unusual, as she knew to answer her phone when her family called her. At about 3.20, Derek encountered Dan McCain, an older man who was enjoying a day out on the trails, and asked him if he had seen Abby or Libby. Dan had not seen either Abby or Libby but told him he had seen a couple under the bridge. While still searching, at 3.30, Derek called Becky and had wondered if there had been some miscommunication and Abby and Libby were already home. Becky had told him no, and Derek expressed his concern for the girls as Libby was not answering her phone. Shortly after the phone call between Derek and Becky ended, Becky contacted Abby and Libby's friends and asked if any of them had seen or heard from the girls. None of them had. Becky then called Kelsey, who was at her boyfriend's house, and asked if Libby had contacted her. Kelsey told Becky that she had not seen or heard from Libby since she had dropped her off. When Kelsey had heard that the girls were missing, she left her boyfriend's house to meet her family at the trail. At 4.20, Becky called Mike at work. When he was told that Libby wasn't answering their phone and they were going to meet at the trails to search for the girls, Mike promptly left work to assist just before Becky left the house. Her son and Libby's uncle, Cody had come in from work. Becky explained to him what was happening, and Cody decided to accompany her to the trails. Around 5 p.m., Derek, Becky, Kelsey, Mike, and Cody were all at the trail searching for Abby and Libby. The family went their separate ways calling out for Abby and Libby. Kelsey and Cody traversed the Monon High Bridge Trail and crossed the bridge together. Kelsey had experience with crossing the bridge with Libby previously, though she was terrified. The first time Kelsey crossed the bridge, she actually had to crawl over to the other side because she felt too uneasy to cross by foot. When Kelsey and Cody reached the end of the bridge, rather than turning back, they proceeded down the hill at the end of the bridge. When describing this point in the search, Kelsey said, me and my uncle crossed the bridge and we were yelling down there. And I remember getting to the end of the bridge and looking to the left and seeing, like somebody had fallen down the hill over there. I didn't think anything of it everybody goes down the hill. After taking my forensics classes, I should have taken a picture of it. There could have been like a footprint of something. 
at the bottom of the hill located at the eastern end of the bridge. There is a long driveway connecting several residences. Kelsey and Cody went as far as knocking on the doors of these residences with the intention of asking the property owners if they had seen Abby and Libby. However, only one person would answer. And as expected, they did not see Abby and Libby. Derek continued to call Libby's phone throughout the duration of the search. Several phone calls later, Libby's phone eventually stopped ringing and would take Derek straight to voicemail. Becky attempted to track Libby's phone through a Find My Phone app, but was unsuccessful, as Libby had reset her device about a week prior due to a glitch. Becky then called their service provider at AMP T and asked if they would be able to track Libby's device. However, this request would prove fruitless, as they were unable to assist. After an hour of searching to no avail, at approximately 5.20 p.m., Mike contacted the police and reported Abby and Libby as missing. Realizing that Anna Williams, Abby's mother, had not yet been notified of her daughter's absence, Becky contacted her, when Anna failed to answer. Becky arrived at Anna's workplace, a restaurant, and explained the details of the girl's lack of response in person. Frustrated with her daughter's presumed irresponsibility, Anna had yet to expect the worst Anna, like Becky, believed that they simply have lost track of time, or wandered too far off and had gotten lost as a result. All Anna had in mind during this time was the stern talking to she was going have to deliver to Abby. When they were finally found, authorities arrived on scene within a half hour after they were notified of the pair's absence. In the beginning, nobody had suspected that the girls met with foul play. The family was questioned at the sheriff's office. Kelsey was questioned more extensively as she was the last person to see the girls. When asked if Libby had posted on any social media platforms, Kelsey opened Snapchat, the app that she knew Libby used most frequently. On Snapchat were two crucial images that were uploaded to Libby's Snapchat story. The photos were estimated to have been uploaded around 2.07 p.m. Law enforcement attempted to ping Libby's cell phone far into the evening, but with no success. It was believed that Libby's phone lost battery life, or had been deliberately turned off. Law enforcement continued to question the family about the girl's internet usage and social media presence but turned up short on leads. Abby did not own a cell phone and would not be permitted to own one until the end of the school year. Abby's only electronic device was her Amazon Kindle tablet, which she had received for Christmas. However, it was discovered that Abby had a Facebook profile that her mother was unaware of. Anna had told Abby that she wasn't allowed to be on Facebook as she was 13. One year under 14 Facebook's minimum age requirement to open an account. It was discovered on this Facebook profile that Abby had a male friend on this account that Anna did not know about. However, this lead was quickly exhausted. Anna said that investigators told her, almost immediately, that they were fairly certain that the girls had not arranged a meeting with someone they met online. Around 6 p.m., as many as 100 local volunteers, as well as the Delphi Fire Department and the Department of Natural Resources assisted law enforcement in the search effort. Nearing midnight, the search was officially called off. It wasn't an individual decision. Rather, there was a meeting amongst several emergency responders. The consensus was that it was too dark to safely traverse the terrain in such conditions. And the search would officially resume the following morning. Moreover, Sheriff Toby Leesonby noted that they had no reason to believe the girls were imminent danger. 
during in an interview where Lisenby was questioned about why the search was called off. He answered, We had learned as far as their history whether they went to each other's homes and did not communicate that to other family members. That had happened in the past. There had been times where the girls had been elsewhere and had not told whether it be their parents or grandparents where exactly they were. February 14. Although the search was officially called off, local volunteers continued to search until the morning. The search officially resumed shortly after sunrise at 8.15 a.m. About 100 searchers were distributed maps and divided into groups of 10-20 people. After searching until noon, the girls' bodies were finally discovered. A few minutes prior to discovering the bodies, a volunteer had asked Kelsey what shoes the girls were wearing. Kelsey replied that Libby was wearing black Nike sneakers. The shoe the volunteer found belonged to Libby. When it was announced that they found Libby's sneaker, a deep sense of dread set in. Kelsey was coming to accept that the outcome wasn't going to be good. Just moments later, the same volunteer perceived a sudden movement near the trees out of the corner of his eye. With his cell phone, the volunteer used his camera to zoom in on the area where he had sensed the movement. On his screen were two curious deer examining the ground floor. As the volunteer approached the deer, there he found the lifeless bodies of Abby and Libby on the north side of Deer Creek on private property less than a mile away from the south end of the bridge. By 1 p.m., authorities secured the crime scene. The FBI became involved immediately. The FBI and Indiana State Police worked 24 hours a day over the course of the following several days to collect crime scene evidence. Though this information was never publicly released by investigators, the police transcripts state that girls' undergarments were located in the creek beneath the bridge. A relatively fresh cigarette butt was also found in the vicinity of the creek. Though it is unclear whether the cigarette was found in the water or by the edge of the creek, Carroll County Prosecutor Robert Ives examined the crime scene in anticipation for a future trial. Robert Ives said that there is a lot of evidence and described the crime scene as odd as well as physically strange and was shocked to find that the case wasn't solved within a matter of days investigation. The following day, the identities of the bodies were officially confirmed to be those of Abby and Libby. At 7 p.m., during a press conference, Indiana State Police released of a man who was reportedly seen on the trail around the time the girls disappeared. The photo captures a Caucasian male walking on the Monon High Bridge wearing a blue jacket, denim jeans with both his hands in his jacket pockets. Since the man is looking down, his facial features are not discernible. It is not clear whether he is wearing a hat, a hood, or no headwear at all. At the time the photo was publicly released, police clarified that they did not consider him a suspect, but that they would like to speak to him. It wasn't until the following Sunday that Indiana State Police officially announced that the man in the photo is now considered a suspect in the investigation. After the announcement, Indiana State Police held a press conference the following Wednesday on February 22. Indiana State Police revealed that Libby captured audio of the suspect on her cell phone. On the audio clip, the suspect can be heard saying, Down the hill, Indiana State Police Sergeant Tony Slocum said, This young lady is a hero. There's no doubt to have enough presence of mind to activate that video system on her cell phone to record what we believe is criminal behavior that is about to occur. Authorities confirm that there is more audio but that it will not be released as the investigation is ongoing.
After the press conference, there was some discussion amongst locals and amateur sleuths about whether or not the phone was recovered at the scene, or if the suspect had taken it. Investigators have clarified that the device was retrieved in the general area where the bodies were found. As investigators remain tight-lipped, little details are known about the current investigation. For instance, authorities refused to reveal the cause of death or comment on the existence of the murder weapon. However, it is known that in the days after the murders were committed, Investigators conducted several door-to-door -door interrogations and thoroughly investigated the 12 sex offenders in Delphi, as well as the hundreds of sex offenders in the surrounding cities. Investigators exhausted their immediate resources by researching double murders across the country, sharing notes with other law enforcement agencies, and clearing all friends, relatives acquaintances, and extended family members of Abby and Libby. Abby and Libby's social media accounts were accessed and analyzed, and all online contacts were located and interviewed. Over 1,000 persons were interviewed in connection with the investigation. Of those interviewees, most have given voluntary DNA samples. Early in the investigation, Police executed 70 subpoenas and 12 search warrants. However, no leads, if any have surfaced, were ever publicized. The investigation remained silent until July 17, months after the murder was committed. Indiana State Police released a composite sketch of the suspect. The composite was composed by a witness. Or witnesses. Account. Sergeant. Kim Riley elaborated. This is information we received from persons who were in the area around the time the girls went. Missing. Either we did not make contact earlier. Or they were afraid to come forward. While one witness could not definitively determine what color. This man's eyes were. She had come close enough to the man that she was confident that his eyes were not blue. The composite sketch depicted a heavy set, older man wearing a newsboy cap and a hoodie. The man's facial features depicted eyes with a notable epicanthic fold, a bulbous nose, and thin, downturned lips. However, investigators plead the public to not focus on the hat. The suspect was described as a Caucasian male between 5 foot 6 and 5 foot 10. Weighing between 180,220 pounds. With reddish brown hair. Persons of interest. When this sketch was released, authorities found that people, particularly internet sleuths, were posting side by side images of people they believed to be suspect and the sketch. While authorities believe that these people generally have good intentions, they have said it's not only damaging to the investigation, but also puts the person pictured, as well as their livelihoods, children, and families, at risk. Nonetheless, the side-by-side -side images spread across the internet. There have been very few known suspects or persons of interest since the day of the murders. The first big publicized break that would bring the case back to surface was the arrest of Daniel Nations, who was apprehended at a traffic stop in Colorado for wielding a hatchet and threatening people on a trail. Nations would later be suspected of the murder of Tim Watkins, an unsolved murder that had occurred on the same trail only two weeks prior. In Nations' car, a red Chevy Prism was a hatchet and a .22 caliber rifle. Nations had an extensive criminal record including petty offenses, domestic violence, and is also a registered sex offender who was charged with indecent exposure after having masturbated in front of a young woman in South Carolina. Nations had connections to Indiana and had claimed to be homeless and living underneath an Indiana 
67 Bridge in Morgan County since January 31, 2017. Indiana State Police had questioned nations in October where they had also obtained his DNA for further processing. In December, Indiana State Police stated that Nations was still being looked at, but he was not currently their top priority. On February 14, the day after the murders were committed, Nations was present for his weekly checkup with authorities and had been consistently attending in the time prior. As of January 5, 2018, Nations pleaded guilty to menacing and was sentenced to three years on supervised probation. Nations has not been legally accused of being involved in Watkins' murder. Another person of interest, then 53-year-old Thomas Bruce, surfaced in November of 2018. On November 19, Bruce entered a religious supply store in St. Louis, Missouri where he forced three women, 53-year-old customer Jamie Schmidt, and two employees, into a back room. Bruce ordered the three women to disrobe and perform sexual acts. However, Schmidt refused to comply with Bruce's demands and was had fatally shot in the head. Indiana State Police contacted St. Louis Police after noting physical similarities between Bruce and the composite sketch. When asked if Bruce had any connection to the Delphi murders, Indiana State Police answered that it was too premature to say. Indiana State Police has not commented on Bruce since. By 2019, another person of interest came to light. In January of 2019, then 46-year-old Charles Eldridge was apprehended during an undercover sting operation in Union City, Indiana after he arranged to have sexual intercourse with a Randolph County police officer that was posing as a 13-year-old girl. Eldridge was charged worth two counts of child molestation. When this news circulated, Indiana residents began flooding the Delphi tip line by bringing Indiana State's police's attention to the recent charges. Many callers noted the physical resemblance between Eldridge and the composite sketch. Furthermore, it had been revealed that Eldridge was familiar with the Delphi murders and previously posted about Abby and Libby on his social media accounts uploaded photos that he took on nature trails, and appeared to have owned several guns. Inundated by calls, Indiana State Police was forced to release a statement regarding Eldridge's arrest Indiana State. Police stated, the Delphi multi-agency investigative team and participating agencies continue to receive media and Public inquiries asking about the person arrested January 8, 2019, in Union City, Randolph County, Indiana for allegations of sexually related crimes against children and if he is connected to the Delphi investigation. The team is aware of this arrest and will investigate to see if there could be any connection to the murders that occurred in Delphi. Indiana on February 14, 2017. The victims were 14-year-old Liberty German and 13-year-old Abigail Williams Delphi is located about 20 miles northeast of Lafayette. It is important for the public and media to know that many similar tips and arrests of other persons alleged to be connected to the Delphi murders occur with some frequency in and outside of Indiana. Each tip, whether it receives media attention or not, is investigated for any connection to the Delphi case. That said, members of the Delphi multi-agency investigative team do not speak to specific actions or steps of the ongoing investigation. In the end, none of these persons of interest led to an arrest. And as of now, investigators are still searching for the suspect. FBI agent Greg Massa presented a behavioral profile of the suspect.
Massa asked the public to think of an individual in their lives who has, for instance, inexplicably cancelled an appointment you had had together. An individual who called into work sick and cancelled an important appointment or engagement. And at the time what would have been a plausible explanation, my cell phone broke or I had a flat tire. But in retrospect that excuse no longer holds water. That may be important. Behavioral indicators this individual may have exhibited since the 13th. Did this individual travel unexpectedly? Did they change their appearance? Did they shave their beard? Cut their hair? Change the color of their hair? The superintendent mentioned that the clothes this individual was wearing in the photo. Did they change the way they dress? Massa also asked people to pay attention to behaviors that are being exhibited more suddenly, such as a sudden change of sleep pattern, sudden abuse of substances, as well as sudden anxiousness or irritability. Delphi homicide moves in new direction. After months of no news. On April 19, 2019, Indiana State Police released a statement titled, Delphi Homicide Investigation Moves in New Direction. The direction noted that the public was welcome to attend a media briefing on the following Monday at the Canal Center in Delphi. Superintendent Doug Carter would make the announcement on behalf of the multi-agency task force. The public grew curious and began to speculate that an arrest was made. New information was going to be released. Or that a new agency would be responsible for the investigation. Come Monday. A room packed with attendees. Including the families of Abby and Libby. Sat in front of a red drape. When the press conference commenced. All eyes and ears were focused on Carter. Within minutes. Carter stated. We're seeking the public's help to identify the driver of a vehicle that was parked at the old CPS, DCS welfare building in the city of Delphi that was abandoned on the east side of County Road. 300 north next to the Hoosier Heartland Highway between the hours of noon to 5 on February 14, 2017. If you were parked there or know who was parked there. Please contact the offices at the command post at the Delphi City Building. In addition, Carter stated that they were releasing additional portions of the audio and asked the public to be aware that the individual speaking was the same individual who had said down the hill. The additional portion of the audio included a singular word, guys. The sentence, guys. Down the Hill was played on repeat for the audience. Furthermore, Carter also released the first footage in the investigation, while only the stills of the suspect on the bridge were available previously. People could now see the suspect in action, crossing the bridge with his head down, and his hands in his pockets. Though the footage lasts all but two two seconds, Carter asked that the public be aware. He is walking on the former railroad bridge. Because of the deteriorated condition of the bridge, the suspect is not walking naturally due to the spacing between the ties. Carter added, During the course of this investigation we have concluded the first sketch released will become secondary. As of today, the result of the new information and intelligence over time leads us to believe the sketch is the person responsible for the murders of these two little girls. We also believe this person is from Delphi currently, or has previously lived here, visits Delphi on a regular basis, or works here. We believe this person is currently between the age range of 18 and 40 but might appear younger than his true age, Carter, who at this time addressed the suspect directly, said directly to the killer, who may be in this room. We believe you are hiding in plain sight. For more than two years, 
You never thought we would shift gears to a different investigative strategy. But we have. We have likely interviewed you or someone close to you. We know this is about power to you. And you want to know what we know. And one day, you will. A question to you. What will those closest to you think of you when they find out that you brutally murdered two little girls? Two children. Only a coward would do such a thing. We are confident that you have told someone what you have done. Or at the very least they know because of how different you are since the murders. It was after Carter concluded his message that the attendees' curiosity would be satisfied. The red drape was finally lifted, revealing yet another composite sketch, one that bore no resemblance to the previous sketch. As expected, the public had many questions. As Carter explained he and the investigative team would not be taking questions for two weeks. It wasn't until Carter sat for an interview with Scott Sander, a reporter from News 8, a local news station, that the public would get their answers. Sander, like many people, was interested in learning whether or not Carter actually believed the suspect was in the room or was speaking figuratively. Carter answered, I think if he wasn't in the room he was close by. But I'm 100% convinced he was watching. Why? Because of all that has happened over the past 30 months. The information we have received. The information we knew. I hope to one day be able to tell that story. Sander also asked why the footage wasn't released sooner. Carter answered. We'll one day be able to tell you what we know and why we didn't release it. We don't want to show our full hand. We don't want to show the complete picture of what we now versus what we think. We have to be very careful there. Remember, it's easy to give an opinion if you don't understand the factual basis of what we've done and why. I don't mean that in a critical sense. But we have to protect the integrity of what we know. Sander then clarified whether or not it's correct that Indiana State Police doesn't want the public to look at both sketches, but only the newly released sketch. Carter answered, that's correct. But remember, a sketch is not a photograph. It's something similar to a resemblance. The likelihood of this being something between the two is likely very strong. But again, that's a subjective opinion based on what I believe. People have criticized Carter and the investigative team for being tight-lipped throughout the course of the investigation. Opinions are strong. And some believe that the investigation was botched. To many, it's unfathomable why Indiana State Police won't release details such as the girl's cause of death. However, Carter, who had addressed the criticism, explains, only the killer knows that. And so do we. We can't show our full had. We just can't. Three years later, since February 13th of this week, it has officially been three years since Abby and Libby were brutally murdered. The case remains unsolved. But authorities remain confident that the case will soon be solved. Indiana State Police did not hold a press conference for the third anniversary. Unlike the past two years, where authorities gathered to provide the public an update. As a result, News 18, a local news station, sat for an interview with Carter. Carter said, we are still as energized now as we were the day after. It's easy to throw out the cold case idea. Nah, we're not even close to that. When asked how close they were to solving the case. Carter answered, one piece away, one piece away, eventually, somebody will do the right thing. It might be the killer himself, might be a person who knows who he is. The families of Abby and Libby hold out hope that this case will be solved. Every morning, they repeat their mantra, today is the day. Mike said, I can't give up hope. What else is there? 
and the fact that I believe in our justice system. I believe in our law enforcement. I believe in our society. Because if we give up and just let people get away with things like this, then what does our society become? Mike later added, Someday I'll meet her again. You know, when the good Lord lets me through the gates. And I hope she's able to say, Thanks, Grandpa. You did a good job. As the investigation goes on, Indiana State Police is currently processing over thousands of tips, waiting for the one tip that they believe is capable of breaking the case. Links.